great news. There's an amazing technology that just might save the world. It's an incredible device, the most complex thing in the universe. And you and I already own one. In fact, we carry it around right here in our skulls. The drag is, and I've looked everywhere. There just doesn't seem to be a user manual. So I decided to spend the last few years hanging out with people who spend their time studying this miraculous technology, brain scientists. And I've learned so much from them about what makes us tick, why we're drawn to some people, why others make us want to run for the hills. And all this has got me to thinking that if everyone could learn some basic things about brain science, this might give us some powerful tools to make our world a more loving and less hateful place. That's what our Citizen Brain series is about. And this fantastic voyage through our neurological wiring begins with a tiny circuit, a circuit that, perhaps more than any other, is the one that makes us human. Empathy is when you imagine what it might feel like to be in someone else's shoes. This can be really hard to do. Like, for example, right now, I'm in my wife's shoes. And it feels awful. Gotta switch to sensible pumps. We humans have been empathizing since before we even had shoes. Compared to other animals, we weren't so good at doing things like leaping or having claws. We survived because we had this one superpower. We could imagine what another person might be feeling. This allowed us to work really well in groups, so we could do stuff like farming and hunting and such. Humans are really social creatures, and to live and survive, we believe we need empathy. So it's not enough to have just um, physical survival on your own. For a human, we have to live in groups, and we have to cooperate and get along. Neuroscientists discovered the empathy circuit when they were working with patients who had a particular kind of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, or FTD. People with FTD tend not to lose their memory, like people with Alzheimer's. Instead, many of them lose their empathy. Imagine an illness when the first manifestation of this is that you don't care about your children, your partner, your loved ones. When someone suffers an illness, you don't care. This breaks down everything about our humanness, our human connection. What connects us to people uh, is suddenly disappearing. When brain scientists were studying people with FTD, they noticed that certain parts of their brain had shut down. They looked at where their empathy wasn't, and that showed them where empathy was supposed to be. And that's when they discovered the empathy circuit. This is a circuit we never realized existed. This is a circuit that um, has grown as the uh, human uh, species has grown. So how exactly does empathy work? Well, let's say I'm hanging out with you. And let's say I start to get upset. Now you start to empathize. You pick up on my emotion and you start reflecting it. And not just in your brain. The more you empathize, the more your whole body can get in sync with mine. Facial expression, heartbeat, breathing, posture. Now you go further. You try to comfort me, because you're obviously such a cool person. And it works. But what if you don't empathize with me? Wow. And I thought you and I were buds. And what if it's not just you and me? What if it's a whole lot of us? Well, then eventually our empathy circuits will actually start to get weaker, and we might become less empathetic to the next person we encounter. We retreat to our own little groups, our family and friends, the people we consider us as opposed to them. And everyone outside of that group becomes the other. Society breaks down. The collective empathy circuit is broken. And we don't know why, but we start to feel 
off. It's because we're not connecting to our fellow humans. We want to reach out, to empathize. It's in our nature. But our empathy circuits are weak, so we tend to connect less and less, especially with people who are outside our little group. Till we reach a point where, because we're so divided, we have all these terrible problems. And also because we're so divided, we can't work together to solve them. And we won't be able to solve them until we get ourselves to answer one crucial question. Who belongs? Once again, brain science can help show us the way. I want to tell you a story. Actually, I want us to tell the story together. It's a story about how, when things are changing rapidly, we can respond in one of two ways. One way is to close ranks with those we consider to be us and try to exclude everyone else. That's othering. Othering comes in many forms, but one of the most virulent is racism. The other way is to expand our conception of us to include as many people as we can. That's belonging. Which way will we choose? Well, that depends on the story we tell ourselves. So I think the two dominant stories, one is the fear. Those people out there, they're out to get you, they're not like you, you need to be afraid of them, build a wall or kill them. And the other one is one of hope and love. It's like, you know, we share something, we can create something, we share the earth, we share each other, and we can learn from each other. So those are two dominant stories. So one is one of fear, one is of hope. Fear or hope. These two stories have been around as long as there have been people. They coexist because the impulse towards both was literally wired into us. It was a matter of survival. If I'm an early human and you suddenly show up in my cave, I have to decide, like, right away. Are you one of us? In which case, a nice hug might be in order. Or one of them. In which case, we might have to throw hands. And in order to make this split-second decision, my brain does one of its favorite things. It categorizes. We have a brain that's very good at classifying. We're very good at thinking about who our own group is and who may be threatening to our own group. There are two systems in our brain that sometimes work against each other. So one is the system of uh, fight and flight, and this is a system in the brain that is very prominent in lower species like amphibians and reptiles, and it essentially is involved with protecting oneself from other animals and attacking other animals for food. And then we have this other grander side in our brain, and this is the part of the brain that is involved with nurturance, empathy, self-awareness, being able to think more broadly about uh, the survival of the planet, being able to think outside ourselves and thinking about the importance of others. Deep down, we all want to belong to connect, to build things together, to solve problems together. In our heart of hearts, we know that that's what brings out the best in us. But if we live in fear, it becomes more likely that our reptilian side will take over instead. And I don't know about you, but I'm living in a lot of fear these days. So in these terrifying times, how do we keep ourselves moving toward togetherness? How do we keep fear from tearing us apart? How do we call on our better angels? By figuring out how to belong without always making someone other, even when that someone is our future self. What if I told you there's a simple way you could add seven and a half years to your life? A procedure that doesn't cost a thing and doesn't involve doing anything difficult or unpleasant. Well, I'm happy to report that this miracle treatment exists and you can start doing it right away, 
even before you finished watching this video. It's backed by science, it's totally safe, and it's all in your mind. Here's the secret. Are you ready? You need to think positively about aging. Really, that's it. Think good thoughts about getting old. Yale professor Becca Levy has shown that people with a positive attitude towards aging live, on average, seven and a half years longer than those with a negative attitude. So what's stopping us from feeling good about aging? Ageism. And right here, I want to make a distinction about aging versus ageism. Aging is normal. It's a fact of nature. All of us are aging all the time. Are you aging? Great, that means you're alive. On the other hand, there's nothing natural about ageism. Ageism, when you discriminate against people just because of how old they are, that's a kind of social sickness. We shouldn't try to fight aging, and we can't anyhow. We can, and should, fight ageism. When does ageism begin seeping into our psyches? It starts early. From the time we're little kids, we're bombarded by the message that old age is just awful. Old people are depicted as fools, creeps, monsters. Who'd want to end up like that? Yuck. This horror continues as we age, when we do everything we can to keep looking young. Except that when we actually get to old age, it's usually a lot nicer than we expected. Studies show that people at either end of the age spectrum tend to be happier than those in the middle. Behold the U-curve of happiness. At this point, some of my younger viewers may be thinking, wow, Josh, being old sounds great. How can I become an old person? And my answer is, be patient and take good care of yourself which means joining the fight against ageism and against another huge blight on our health, loneliness. Have you ever wondered why it hurts so much to be lonely? Well, here again, brain scientists are giving us some exciting answers. In this case, with the help of a tiny worm and a truly unpopular rodent. The worm is called C. elegans, also known as the roundworm. But who wants to say roundworm when you can say C. elegans? You can find it in your garden's compost heap, happily munching on rotting vegetables and such. The rodent is the prairie vole, an adorable little critter. You can also find it in your garden, which chances are it is cheerfully destroying. These two small creatures are helping scientists unlock the mysteries behind one of the worst afflictions a human being can have, loneliness. First, let's just get one thing out of the way. Is there a way to tell if a roundworm is, is truly lonely? No, I don't think that we could say that a roundworm is lonely. It's a human construct, really, the whole idea of loneliness. But we can tell if it prefers hanging out with its fellow roundworms, dwelling, or getting away from them, roaming. And we can figure out what's going on in its nervous system at all times because compared to us, C. elegans are very simple. Like humans have about 86 billion neurons, which makes things really complicated. On the other hand, C. elegans have 302. Just 302 neurons, maybe 303 on a good day. So they're much easier to study. They're living, behaving animals. And even though they can't, you know, sing an opera or write a novel, they can do fairly sophisticated maneuvers like learn new memories or forage for food. They have social interactions with one another. Yet another cool thing about these worms, they're transparent. So researchers can actually see what's going on inside them. 
As a result of all these cool qualities, C. elegans have been crucial in the development of drugs to fight cancer and all kinds of other amazing advances, including new discoveries in the study of loneliness. When they have normal amounts of some certain chemicals, they have normal amounts of social interaction and normal amounts of time spent dwelling versus exploring. The chemicals that control that, serotonin, is the exact same chemical in humans that regulates mood. So, thanks to C. elegans, we can see a possible link between social isolation and mood disorders like depression. And what C. elegans can't tell us about loneliness, maybe prairie voles can. What makes uh, at least the voles that we study, which are prairie voles, um, exceptional is that prairie voles belong to about 4 the population of about 4% of mammals that are socially monogamous. You have the prairie voles and they, they mate for life, like they meet early on, I assume, and I guess they would meet in a garden or something. Or, or a prairie. Or, or prairie, prairie, right, prairie voles. <laughs> you know, you have to wake up really early to <laughs> get something past me. Uh, so you have your prairie voles and, and they, they tend to mate for life. And then you have, I believe, the, the montan. Montane or meadow voles. Montane, and both of those are kinds of voles are promiscuous. Yeah, those animals tend to live more in social isolation, so they don't really stick around in the way that prairie voles do for both of them to take care of the offspring and then to sort of live in these family units. So they sort of wander off and then they've met another female and they go on to mate with them. Just like with us humans, when prairie voles become isolated from those they care about, they can experience the pain of social loss that we call loneliness. And just like with us, the resulting stress can do serious damage, especially in the brain. What's causing all these changes? So you probably heard of cortisol, so that is definitely a hormone that we think and we know correlates with stress in humans. The hormone version of that in voles is also something that we can look for in the blood and what's circulating in the animals when we put them under social stress. So, thanks to prairie voles, researchers are learning tons about loneliness and the brain. But in order to combat the human blight of loneliness, we're also going to have to go outside the lab. There was a terrific study in Ireland that paired isolated and lonely older adults with volunteers, who were also elderly. After a series of regular visits by these volunteers, the subjects tended to become less lonely. And as a bonus, the volunteers tended to become less lonely as well. That study's principal investigator, Dr. Brian Lawler, points out that healthcare professionals and policymakers need to make treating loneliness a priority. We know about the health risk of smoking and the health risk of being overweight. And there are public health policies about smoking and weight, obesity. But the risk of dying from loneliness and isolation is about the same as light cigarette smoking, and it's probably greater than obesity, but we don't have a public health approach or policy around loneliness. So it's not just about examining the chest or examining the heart, it's understanding the person. It's listening to the person and asking the right questions. And as I say, you know, are you lonely? Who are the most important people in your life? You, you, you learn an awful lot very quickly from those two questions. By treating everyone with kindness and consideration, even if just for a moment, we can vastly improve their quality of life and our own. Human civilizations can be beautiful, but they can truly thrive only when everyone is seen and heard, when all voices are counted, and for that to happen, no one can be left to suffer in isolation. Does this goal seem far-fetched or naive? Don't be too sure. And I mean that literally. Don't be too sure. Because it's super important to balance certainty and doubt. Why? Well, you could say that I'm of two minds about that. Take the left side of my brain, for example. It's a real go-getter, positive, forward-thinking, and just bursting with words and theories. The left hemisphere controls the right hand. It's ready to reach out and grab what it wants. 
Hiya, pal, put her there. Let's make a deal and uh, give me that. In very general terms, the left side of our brain is where certainty rules. On the other hand, the right hemisphere has a totally different vibe. It's mysterious and moody, and though it's wordless, we can infer that it's worried, pessimistic, and protective of us and others. The right side of the brain keeps trying to help us avoid dangers and potential failures. It's where doubt hangs out. All of this goes back to the same question that roundworms have to ask themselves. Should we try to venture out? or just stay huddled together. We're caught between two forces. One is going forward in anticipating reward, and the other is pulling back, anticipating or fearing punishment. To survive, we need a balance between these two. Now, these do act out in the brain, roughly speaking, in the two halves of the brain, with the left half of the brain in general, being more approach-oriented, and the right half of the brain, in general, having a tendency to be more avoidance-oriented. The two halves of the brain compete with each other, so that if one becomes strong or the other becomes weak, it tends to inhibit, they tend to inhibit each other. As true as this is for what goes on inside our brains, it's just as true for what goes on between our brains, in the constant back and forth among the various members of our society, in what you might call our collective brain, or, if you will, our citizen brain. The health of the citizen brain depends on every citizen neuron being able to contribute ideas without being inhibited by the others. And to pull that off, we need to combine our individual empathy circuits into a big, healthy, collaborative one. In a culture or in a society, empathy does emanate out from individuals. Those kinds of feeling states could rapidly be transmitted across people, communities, uh, states, countries. It starts with just a small leap of imagination between you and me. And then it spreads in more little leaps and more till it all adds up to one enormous enormous leap, so powerful that it can solve seemingly insurmountable problems. It seems like it's not just like a cool thing or maybe a fun thing to learn about how your brain generates empathy and what the empathy circuit is, but it actually is an important thing. It's like an important thing as a citizen or as a parent or... It's the most important thing. Wait, say that again? <laughs> it's the most important thing to be empathic. When you see people with frontotemporal dementia, they are alone, they are isolated. And you can imagine a country losing this circuit. They will become isolated, they will become alone. And conversely, you can imagine uh, what happens to a person who cares about others, who connects to other people. Their world gets bigger, richer. So brain science is, can help us to save the world. It can help us to save humanity. I think we must unite. There's so many things that threaten humanity that will make things worse if we aren't united, if we don't work together. We can do this. We have to do it. We want to do it. You feel me? I think you do. Now, if you want to learn more about these topics, please check out our individual episodes at citizenbrain.org.